right now. We have the temperature so we find the temperature of five degrees. Heat itself, it can be defined and be defined as a form of thermal energy which flows from a hot region and the hot region you can see the hot region is a thermally high region thermal thermal high region to a cool the cool region and that cool region we can refer to it as our thermal low region. And the region that is low of thermal energy. And one thing we must take note of is that this heat flow is going to continue until the body is able to attain thermal equilibrium. Until the body is able to attain thermal equilibrium. And when we say thermal equilibrium, that's that point where there is no net change or net loss of heat energy. I get to me now. Heat is not flowing between the two bodies in contact as a result of the fact that they have both been able to attain same thermal content. And when you have same thermal content, for example, this object is 75 degrees Celsius and this is 75 degrees Celsius, when they are together, heat is not going to flow from the two bodies. I get to me now. All that will happen is that they all have the same temperature and that point for thermal equilibrium. And at thermal equilibrium, the body has what we call equilibrium temperature. So this flow continues. This flow continues until the body attains the body attains attain what we call thermal equilibrium. Next thing now is what do we mean by the term thermal equilibrium? What do we mean by thermal equilibrium? At thermal equilibrium, this is the point where there is no net loss of heat energy or heat content between two bodies in contact. This is the point where there is no net loss of transfer of energy between two bodies or regions. And one thing is that thermal equilibrium is as a result of <clears throat> lack of temperature difference. That means the two bodies in contact have been able to attain the same temperature. And temperature is the measure of kinetic energy. That means the total number or amount of thermal energy in both bodies are now found to be equal. I get to me now. It follows the same procedure as like your diffusion. So I can say that um, this is due to lack of temperature, temperature difference between two bodies in the continent. 
temperature at which one thing that the temperature at which both body I get him now have been able to attain thermal equilibrium is called the equilibrium temperature. So I can write this temperature where both bodies attain thermal equilibrium. Very, very important and very key. So we've been able to explore this information now. We now want to look at um, <clears throat> some of the factors that affect all the factors that affect that effect of heat rather. Effect of heat. Effects. Of heat. One thing we must do is there are a lot of effects that can be observed as a result of heating an object, and we just mention the number of these effects. Number one, <coughs> number one, we can talk about. Increase, increase in temperature, and we must be able to appreciate the fact that when heat is added to a system, the higher the amount of heat added to a system, the higher the increase in temperature. We are able to notice that. So when you increase the heat of a system automatically there will be an increase in temperature. Then we can also talk about the change in state of matter. What controls the state of matter is the amount of kinetic energy possessed by different states of matter. And one thing is that heat breaks bonds. And once these bonds are broken, I get to tend to change <coughs> the state of the matter. And that's very, very key. We have to use the matter, solid, liquid, and that gas visually, aside from the plasma, which is the first one. These three states of matter as a result of the amount of kinetic energy possessed by each heat. So meaning that when you heat the solid, you are inducing kinetic energy into that solid at the end of the day. That solid becomes liquid. The molecules become free to move. And when further heat is applied to the liquid, they tend up to become gases. I get me now. And that's as a result of heat. Now we'll also look at the other effect of heat. We have expansion. Expansion. When an object is heated, the object tends to expand. I get me now. It tends to expand and it will be the corresponding increase in the size of the object that will refer to as expansion. So we can also look at another effect of heating. We have the thermionic emission. Thermionic emission. And when we talk about thermionic emission, that has to do with the liberation of electrons from a surface when it is applied to that surface. I think I should write something on that one. The liberation, the liberation of electrons from the surface when heated. That means of thermionic emission. We will explore more information about emissions of electrons from surface. We will talk about photoelectric effects, and that is in your physics. Who, who, for explain this kind of information. Then we now have um, another effect of heat. 
change the physical properties of the matter. We are sending the physical properties that we were exploring that in thermometry, that thermometry properties and processes. Then we also have um, um, the new okay, nature of the new emission. Then I can also talk about by the family stream effect, which has to be the bending of two um, joint steels or metals as a result of differences in their temperature or should I their thermal expansivity. This is literally an application of thermal expansivity with the looking thick into it as we move on. So these are the major effects of it, but one important effect here that is the major function of this is temperature. And I'll be expatiating more on that now and talk to temperature. I believe in our you know, full level programs, you come across various definitions of temperature where you hear that temperature can be defined as the degree of hotness and coolness of the body. But I'll come to you today to actually modify that definition. As an A-level student, you must be able to illustrate the effect of kinetic energy um, on, on, on temperature. I get now or the effect of um, the induction of kinetic energy as a result of increase in temperature. So you can define temperature as the degree or the measure of what kinetic energy in a system. Temperature can be defined as the measure of the degree of kinetic energy in the system of objects. That's what temperature is. The degree of kinetic energy, or the measure of the degree of kinetic energy in the system of objects. We can also appreciate that Temperature is the hotness and coldness of the body. And also, the same to be the hotness and coldness of the body. Very important to take note of the fact that. Temperature is a major function of heat. Temperature is a major function of heat. Temperature is a major function of heat. I get me now. So is the is the major factor. I get me now. That should be considered when you're talking about heat because for every increase in heat, temperature of that object must increase. I get you now, temperature of the object <clears throat> must increase. That's typical for you. Now, temperature can be measured making use of a thermometer. Temperature can be measured. Making use of the thermometer. The thermometer is an instrument, and we have various types of thermometer, which we won't be talking about in this lecture. We have the clinical thermometer, that is the alcohol in glass, liquid in glass thermometer. We have your maximum and minimum thermometer, which measures the temperature of the environment or the surrounding. I guess we know. But the, 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 term, the thermometer that measures the highest temperature is called the pyrometer. I think you should just note that down. The pyrometer. The pyrometer measures measures the highest measures. 
very high. Let me go very high. Very high. Thank you. Very high. Thank you. That's a pyrometer. Good. Now we will move forward to the to the expatiating on our thermometers now. We're looking at thermometric skills. We're looking at thermometric skills. We're looking at thermometric skills. And we have three basic or major thermometric skills. <laughs> now, when we talk about thermometry skills, we have three major thermometry skills. There are three major thermometry skills. It's having two fixed points, two fixed points. Now, in the metric scale, there are two fixed points, which are the upper fixed point, upper fixed point, also known as the boiling point, and uh, the lower this point, the last this point, is the best one, the freezing, freezing point. I get me now. And those values vary. So the three major skills we have, the three major thermometric skills, Include the three major thermometric skills. Include we have the Kelvin, we have your degree Celsius, and finally we have your degree Fahrenheit. So these are the three major and uh, thermometric skills. Take note that it takes say the new Kelvin. The new Kelvin is very wrong to use. Okay, I'll be demonstrating each of them. They are over six point and they are lower six point now. We have this for each of them. <clears throat> right here, I'm writing their upper six point. I get lower six. Now uh, let's assume this is for a uh, Kelvin scale. Let's run this for a Kelvin scale. And for a Kelvin scale, we have we have your upper fixed point to be three seven three Kelvin and lower fixed point to be. 273 Kelvin. See that now? But for your um, degree Celsius, your degree Celsius, also called centigrade, you have the lower fixed point to be zero degree Celsius, and your upper fixed point to be, to be 100 degree Celsius. Then for your degree Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, we have the upper fixed point to be 212 degree Fahrenheit, and the lower fixed point to be 32 degree Fahrenheit. These are the upper fixed point and lower fixed point of the three major thermometric scales. And each of them have their temperature interval 
بود یا تمام میچی این تابلو. آدی گلی این تابلو. این تابلو از سوبتراکشن از اپاتیکس پوینت از لواتیکس پوینت. And by the time you see this over fixed point minus this lower fixed point of the Kelvin scale, you will get in the interval of Kelvin scale. This statement here also means that 373 Kelvin is the same thing as 100 degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Same thing with the lower fixed point. 0 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 273 Kelvin and also equivalent to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means, from what I said now, the interval. The interval, still interval, the still interval of your of them, your Kelvin scale will be giving you 373 and it's 273 Kelvin, and that will be 100 Kelvin. The degree Celsius interval will be 100 degrees Celsius and a zero degree Celsius, and I give us 100 Celsius. And for your degree Fahrenheit interval, you should be having um, 212. You have it 212 minus 32 degree Fahrenheit, and that will give us 180 Fahrenheit. So very, very important and very, very. We have formulas or techniques that are used in deriving some relationship between Kelvin and the uh, Celsius, same thing as rival relationship between the Celsius and the Fahrenheit. So let's quickly check out the relationship between the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scale. The relationship between the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scale quickly. We will be having what's the relationship to go of them now? Relationship between Celsius and RNA. So how do we relate them to obtain the formula and collect them? This process I'm going to be using is the technique and not the formula. Because you might be giving question where it might not be between Celsius and Vera, and I think it's between um, um, resistivity and um, temperature scale, like um, that's your resistance thermometer scale and your degree Celsius. It's the technique you need to understand. So this now, I will be relating, I'll, I'll put my skills for Celsius here, which is 100 degrees Celsius, then my fixed point at 0 degrees Celsius. And I'll put my <coughs> temperature scales for Fahrenheit here, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, I have 32 degrees Fahrenheit here. Then let's imagine there's an unknown point, right? Here. I get you now. And that unknown point here, let's call this place, and let's ignore the skills. You know, at this place, we are recording our Celsius. I yeah, don't get confused. I don't do the revision. Okay, let's call this place a degree Fahrenheit, and we don't know. And call this place a degree Celsius. I will don't know. Now, all you do is this minus this, followed by this minus this, equals to this minus this, to by this one. The same procedure. This minus this has degree Fahrenheit minus 32. All over this kind of thing is that 212 minus 32. And now, because we the same process at this other side, the good solution minus zero divided by 100 minus zero. And what does that give us? We'll be having, we'll be having degree Fahrenheit minus 32. All over 180 equals to the good solution minus zero degree Celsius to about 100. So let's cross multiply and see what we obtain. Let's cross multiply and see what we obtain. So from that there, let me just bring out what I have there here. I have degree Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 180 equals to degree Celsius over 100. So cross multiplication now gives us what? 
This time this gives us 180 degrees Celsius equals to this time this gives us 100 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 100 as 3200. I can divide through, without making degrees Celsius of your formula, I will divide through by 180. That will be giving me what? Degree Celsius. 180 degrees Celsius equals to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 3200, divided by 180, divided by 180, divided by 180, 180 counts to 180. And here I have 3 here will go 5, and 3 here will go 9. You get 0 counts to 0 here. And when we subtract, when we divide the 320 by 18, what does it give us? I'm having degrees Celsius equals to 5 over 9. Degree Fahrenheit minus 320 divided by by 15 to give us let's divide it. We have that two can go here um, nine two can go in one and um, 320 one six zero. If I'm not mistaken, one six zero yes. Then what else can go? Let me quickly just get my calculator. So I can put this in. Okay, so what we have there is 17.7, 17.7, get that down. So that's what we obtained from what we did. Very, very straightforward process. Very, very easy, no confusion at all, very straight. Okay, so that's for our relationship between Celsius and Fahrenheit. I told you don't cramp the procedure. Procedure is not to be cramped. All you just need to know um, is to understand the techniques that is being followed here. Okay. Okay. Now we have been able to do this now. That is a relationship. Let's now talk about um, let's go down to thermometric properties. Thermometric properties. Thermometric processes. There are actually a number of thermometric processes. Very we hear what thermometric processes. These are the processes that are being affected by temperature change. These are processes, processes or properties that are affected by temperature, by temperature change. They are affected by temperature change. Okay, and what we say, affected by temperature change, we have a number of those kind of properties. Number one, we have expansion. Expansion is actually affected by expansion. And you can observe this one in your thermometer bulb, and that's thermometric liquid. 
there's that. The thermometric liquid tends to rise up, I get me now, as a result of increase in temperature. I get me now. Which rises up due to increase in temperature. Then the second thermometric property I'll be talking about is your resistivity. I can call it resistance. Now, it is very important for you to know that the resistivity of a material, I get me now, reduces as temperature is reduced. And that resistivity increases as temperature is decreased. And that will be demonstrated from the process I'll be showing you right now. For the little right down, increase temperature increases resistivity. Now, this can be demonstrated in a very simple experiment. Let's imagine this is a resistance wire here connected to a bulb. I get you now that you have the cells like that. And so on, but this one I want to focus on. Now, if you should apply heat to this resistance wire, are you getting me now? It is observed that when heat is applied to this resistance wire, that the bulb or the light intensity reduces. When heat is applied to this resistance wire, the light intensity reduces. And when light intensity reduces, it's telling you that this resistance has increased. That means the flow of current to this bulb has been reduced. Are you getting what I'm saying? So automatically, increase in resistivity, or sorry, increase in temperature, are you getting me now? Affect resistivity by the one, by increasing the resistivity. But if you remove this fire here and you place ice block on this western wire, this globe will shine brighter, meaning that the resistance in this coil to be reduced and there is a formula that actually connects or controls the resistivity of this material so you see the resistance that rt the resistance at a given temperature is equal to the resistance at zero of the wire at zero at zero plus oh, sorry open bracket one plus alpha where alpha stands for the temperature coefficient of resistance, which has a constant value of 0 0.00366 ohms times temperature gradient. Very, very key. Then RT stands for what? RT stands for your resistance, resistance at zero, sorry, at a temperature, at a given temperature. That is your RT. Are we together? Then we also have your, we also have your RO, and your RO stands for resistance at zero temperature at zero degree Celsius. Then your alpha, I say, stands for what? Temperature coefficient of resistance. Temperature coefficient of resistance, and it has a constant value of 0 0.00366 ohms per degree Celsius. And then the change in temperature is the temperature change. We have another thermometric process that we must take note of here. This is for resistivity. Another thermometric process you must take note of is your magnetism. All these processes, you must be able to illustrate them with the examples I'm giving you. This one, I use the um, um, clinical thermometer, as, uh, your normal thermometer, laboratory thermometer, where I say the kink, I mean the fluid or the liquid inside we increase as a result of change the temperature. 
resistance there, I told you that when a fire or heat is applied to a coil of wire, that you find out that the bulb, are you getting me now, shines brighter, meaning that the resistance has been what? Has been increased. Sorry, goes dim, showing that the resistance has been what? Increased. And vice versa. Okay, now, we want to go to the number three thermometric property. We want to go to the number three thermometric property. And that is going to be our magnetism. That's going to be magnetism. Magnetism. Okay. Now, how does magnetism affect telemetric property? Or why is it a telemetric property? Rather? Now, whenever temperature is increased, the magnetic power or the magnetic force of a magnet tends to reduce. And this is that we illustrate it now to you, number three, magnetism. Magnetism increase in temperature, even the temperature reduces the magnetic properties of the magnet. Now, this can be demonstrated this way. Imagine we have a bar, uh, sorry, let's, let's use a um, horseshoe magnet. I get me now, that's not south pole. And at the end of the day, it's attached or it's able to magnet a rod. I've been able to magnet a rod. To demonstrate how magnetism is a, is, a, is a thermometric property, once heat is applied to this rod from this instance here, and for a given period of time, you will observe that this magnetic force between the rod and the magnet and the magnet tends to what to weaken. I get it now until this rod falls away. That tells you that an increase in temperature actually reduces magnetic properties of materials. Okay. Then we also have we also have another important one: thermoelectric power. Thermoelectric power. Thermoelectric power. Now, this thermoelectric power <clears throat> that we're going to talk about right here, just imagine we have a coil of wire like this that is tied together at this junction here, and um, a galvanometer, the, the point of attachment of the two wires. Are you getting now? If heat is applied to this end of the wire, if heat is applied to this end of the wire, it is actually observed that, um, for example, let's imagine this is zinc or copper. Are you getting now? Unless I'm using my copper wire, I'm using my copper wire. When heat is applied, this galvanometer begins to read an amount of current. And that tells you that what? That increase in heat or temperature tends to increase the flow of electric current. That means it increases the thermoelectric power of the system. Increased temperature increases Thermoelectric power. 
all these properties to be given to you to explain. Now, you observe that when you hit this portion, it begins to turn red. And that redness in the coloration also informs us, we shouldn't take it for granted, also informs us of the last thermometric property that we'll be talking about here. So the second is last, rather, and that will be color. Unbelievable. Color. You see that color is a thermometric property. Even when we start talking about black body radiation, you will understand better. That is in your um, 404. We're not talking about black body radiation. You see that different intensity of color have their different ways of what of getting affected by temperature. I guess you know, even if it's in terms of absorption or in terms of um, in terms of ability to to radiate heat. I guess you know temperature actually has an effect on the color. I guess you know. So color is the next one. So let's look at the next and number six. I think this one is in terms of the intensity. Of and the last one is thermal, thermal expansion. Thermal expansion. You know that when it is applied to a body, that body tends to expand. I guess you know. The thermal expansion is something that increase. Heat causes the corresponding, so the corresponding increase in increase in heat or temperature. The corresponding increase in temperature it increases the size. And with this, we have been able to cover everything in our thermometric properties and temperature. The last thing we're talking about in this aspect is our expansivity. Another separate video we made to solve questions pertaining to this topic. We'll be solving questions from both temperature and linear expansivity, area expansivity, superficial expansivity, volume expansivity, and normal loss expansion of water. Are you getting that? We have basically three types of expansion. A three types of expansivity rather. We have basically three types of expansivity. We have basically three types. Let me highlight it in red. Expansivity, which is related by alpha. Sorry, linear expansivity represented by alpha. We have the, the uh, area expansivity, area expansivity also referred to as superficial. Superficial passivity, and that's beta. And lastly, we have the cubic of volume expansivity. The cubic of volume expansivity is represented as like gamma. And we must appreciate the fact that we know that 
one linear hyperbility equals two beta hyperbility. Sorry. Two have a linear expansivity equal to one um, area expansivity. And also, you must know that three linear hyperbility equals to one QB expansivity. So, with that, we can now talk about the meaning of linear expansivity. When we say linear expansivity, what do we really mean? Linear expansivity simply means the increase in length per unit length per degree drive in temperature. For every temperature rise, the amount of increase in length we shoot to the original length is all called linear expansivity. That's another way to find it. So, all this that we've spoken here can be treated with this formula. Linear expansivity equals to increase in length, that is L2 minus L1, over initial length, that is by unit length, then by the rest of the time. That's the way we can do that. We can do that to change L2 over L1 to change the where L2 is your final length, initial length, final temperature, initial temperature. I get it now. Someone is your initial temperature and starts with the final temperature. This is the that tells you the amount of temperature it was increased by as you change the temperature and change the length tells you by uh, what factor the length was increased. Okay, it is measured. In fact, expansivity is generally measured in and Kelvin. Expansivity is generally measured in per Kelvin. So linear expansivity is measured in per Kelvin, gamma expansivity per Kelvin, area expansivity per Kelvin. Very, very key for us to know that. <laughs> then we now focus now on the next one. Area expansivity, also known as partial expansivity. Once you know the definition for linear expansivity, it's just for you to change wherever you see length, you fix it area. <laughs> area expansivity. Also called artificial expansivity. I already said it. This one now is the increase in area by units area. Per degree rise in temperature. Increase in area by unit area, that is by the original area per degree rise in temperature. And that one now we can do beta equals to. A2 minus A1 all over A1 over A2 thousand. This must be the area all over the area in the temperature. You see that now? So the same process happens for your gamma expansivity. So that last one, QB of volume expansivity. And the cubic of volume expansivity is the increase in volume. Increase in volume. I get it that now. In volume. Per unit volume. Per degree. Right. In temperature. And that is represented as gamma equals to. V2 minus V1 all over V1 over V2 minus V2 over V2 over V2 over V2 over V1 into temperature. Finally, we'll talk about anomalous expansion of water. Anomalous expansion of water.
Now, the anomalous expansion of water is just talking about the abnormal behavior of water. While other substances, normally we say every substance is supposed to expand when heated, but water tends to misbehave um, within the range, temperature range of um, that's zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius. And that's what we want to study now in, in a very short and brief way. And no malus expansion of water. So the anomalous expansion of water is, is a phenomenon, a phenomenon that describes the abnormal behavior of water. Describe the abnormal behavior of water, which occurs between, between the temperature range of zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius. That's the temperature range. Zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius. What happens? Normally, when temperature increases, from this zero degree Celsius to four degree Celsius, the normal substance is supposed to be expanding, but water contracts within these two temperatures. And since water is contracting within these two, these two temperatures, it stops contracting at four. I get it now. And when they say something is contracting, that means you are reducing automatically, meaning that it's meaning that it is at four degrees Celsius that water will now obtain its minimum volume. So you can see. Because since water stops and um, contracting, or as it stops, water contracts rather than expand from zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius. Obtaining, obtaining its max, maximum volume, obtaining maximum volume, obtaining the maximum volume at that four degrees Celsius, because that's where we stop contracting. But anything above four degrees Celsius, what will now start expanding normally. We begin to be normal. I guess it now. What my is it? That is its minimum volume. I wrote maximum volume. It's minimum volume. Because at that point, you must have finished contracting. Now, since that is minimum volume at that four degrees Celsius, and we know that we can recall that from our formula of density, density equals to mass over volume. That means the relationship between volume and density is inverse. That means when volume reduces, density increases. Automatically, since water attains the minimum volume at four degrees Celsius, that means it attains maximum density at that same point. You get Because water Attains its maximum maximum density at four degrees Celsius. Very very simple. This is the reason. Where volume is minimum normally based on this relationship, and the density towards maximum. And the whole of this phenomenon we just demonstrated here is referred to as the normal loss expansion of water. So we'll be solving questions on real and apparent expansions. We'll be solving questions from all these phenomena. 
So that will be in a separate video, which will be titling part two. Which will be titling part two of your of your linear of your thermal physics and your thermometry. I get me now of your thermometry and temperature. Get yeah, that now. So stay tuned, stay well. I advise you to read constantly. Any problem you have from this aspect, you can contact us at guaranteed. I get me now, you can contact us at guaranteed. I believe you have a number for just for an intention purpose. Zero nine zero three nine nine. The truth is that you have a lot of things to benefit once you find yourself in the right place. And I'm not condemning every other thing, but I can give you my words that there is an optimum and amount of energy uh, that is what academic um, content to actually gain from guaranteed tutorials. So I advise you to be there. All right. So stay tuned. Good luck to your studies.